Hi, everyone. We're going to get started in just a minute. We're giving everybody a minute to, um, to join the webinar. Okay, thank you everyone. So my name is Claire Johnson and I'm here from Ferry Godboss. I wanna say thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Building Your Career in Wealth Management with RBC Wealth Management. I have the pleasure today of moderating what I think is gonna be a very fascinating discussion. We will have time for questions at the end. So if you have a question, you can use the QA functionality, drop it in there. I believe you can be anonymous or if you prefer, you can drop your chat questions into the chat. So RBC Wealth Management has provided trusted advice and wealth management solutions for individuals and families and institutions for more than 100 years. It has also made gender parity a priority. So they advance women into leadership roles. And today we are lucky enough to have three of those women joining us to talk about their careers at RBC. I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. Brooke, would you like to go first and tell us you know, who you are and what you do at RBC. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for uh, inviting us to participate in this very important panel today. Um, I hope that you gain lots of insight and hopefully some um, key takeaways to help you in your path and your, in your career. Um, as Claire mentioned, my name is Brooke McGeehan and I am a financial advisor with RBC Wealth Management uh, based in Princeton, New Jersey. I spent most of my time um, with RBC actually in our Midtown New York City office. And it wasn't until a few years ago that RBC tapped me on the shoulder and asked if I would consider um, becoming the manager of the Princeton office and relocating professionally. Um, I'm excited to share more with you about that and why I made that decision um, later in this discussion. Um, I live in Westfield, New Jersey. I have two kids. I have a boy who's in fifth grade. His name is Colin. I have a daughter uh, in second grade. Her name is Riley. They are absolutely um, my um, pride possessions, um, but they know mom works and they know mom works really hard. And um, I love that they see that. And again, I'm happy to share later in the panel about that balance of work life and being an awesome mom and an awesome financial advisor, because you really can do both. So um, there's just a little glimpse of some things that we can talk about. Great. Well, thank you, Brooke. Jerry, would you like to go ne next and introduce yourself? Sure. Um, and I, I second everything that Brooke said, and thank you for allowing us to join you today and to share our stories. And we're very excited. I mean, this is, we, all three of us are extremely passionate about this business and what we do. Um, and my name is Jerry Laranaga. I am a financial advisor as well with RBC Wealth Management. I am located in the Pueblo, Colorado office, which is about 100 miles south of Denver, Colorado. I've been lucky enough to be with this firm for 25 years. Um, as a financial advisor, I as well tapped on the shoulder many years ago to become a branch manager. And so I've been in that leadership role. Currently, uh, we have a women's advisor group. It's a Women's Association of Financial Advisors. And I am the current president of our WAFA, which this year we are celebrating our 30th anniversary. Uh, Brooke McGeehan was our most recent past president. And I have been, I'm a single mom. My, I have two, two boys, uh, now 22 and 25. And both of them are in their higher education and just finishing undergrad. And also one is currently in a doctorate program. So as a single mom, having this career has been instrumental um, to, you know, with what Brooke said as well, the kids, they know that mom works 
and she works very hard and she's very passionate. And with that, I've had the support of my children, but I've had an amazing work-life balance to be able to raise them as a single mom and help them further. I never missed an event for them, but I've also had all the time that I've needed to be with my clients and be with my office. And so there again is further information in the discussion. And for that, I can pass it over to Christine. Thank you. Uh, I'm Christine Cisco. I am the uh, financial advisor also and the branch director in Buffalo, New York. Uh, like Brooke, uh, tapped on the shoulder to relocate uh, to become a branch director. Fortunately, uh, my clients are just a few hours away in Watertown, New York, which if you know New York State is very far away from Midtown Manhattan, which is where Brooks' office was. We're miles and miles apart. Uh, but I, too, have two boys, uh, like Jerry does. Mine are uh, 21 and 18. Uh, I have been in the business for 25 years. So uh, those two boys, uh, uh, my oldest son was brought to the office with me when I first started. And uh, we put his, his seat right underneath the desk. So um, if I needed to grab him, I could pull him out and, uh, you know, feed him. Or, uh, But it allowed me to make phone calls when I needed to. And, and uh, so they've been to mom's office many, many times. So uh, that's a little bit about me. Great. Wonderful. So uh, just continuing on that, uh, Christine, can you tell us, I, I know you said you've been with the company for 25 years. Uh, can you tell us a bit about your career path and what kind of led you to where you are yep. now? So I haven't been with RBC for 25. I've been here for 12. I've been okay. a financial advisor for 25. I started on the insurance end. Uh, so I started uh, with an insurance company first. Uh, selling insurance and insurance uh, sales also do investments. And I realized very quickly that um, I really liked the investment side of the business. I like to offer life insurance to clients and, and insurance solutions to their needs, but it wasn't my primary focus. I really wanted to help them meet their goals. And I really enjoyed financial planning um, and looking at their picture holistically. So I moved from uh, that to a brokerage uh, firm at that point. So, and I um, started my career in marketing. I was not a financial advisor. So, um, I happened to be at a career fair for a client talking to them about checking accounts at the bank I worked with. And the gentleman next to me worked for the insurance company and said, Christine, you'd be good at this business. You should consider it. And I was young. And I had a lot of student loan debt that I had to pay. And I thought, geez, he can pay his bills. So <laughs> maybe that's a good way to go. Excellent. That's, yeah, that's, it's nice to have somebody recognize in you a quality and encourage you in your career. So Jerry, uh, how about you? Can you tell us a little bit about your career path and what really led you to RBC? Well, uh, what led me to RBC was I relocated uh, from a different state. And again, I had, I had a six month old and I was already licensed. I had already worked for a previous firm. And at the time I was just looking to, I wanted to continue holding my licenses and, but I didn't want to work full time at that, you know, just having the young child. Um, I literally just walked in the door and asked to see the manager that day. And it was RBC. Uh, I knew, you know, I'd already been, had the licenses. I'd been in the industry. I knew I wanted to be in the industry. And I, you know, sat down, met with the manager. And two days later, he hired me, allowed me to work part-time, allowed me to set my, my hours. But I have to, you know, honestly admit at the time when I was hired, I was actually a, a client associate. I worked for, I was not hired as a financial advisor. I was a support staff and in a support role. And even though I did have my licenses, but that, you know, that was my bailiwick at the time. Um, I worked for three advisors, um, learning how to balance and understand their priorities and go from there and, and getting more and more involved with clients. And I got my insurance license as the advisors that I was working for in a support role 
they were very heavy in insurance and, you know, life insurance and annuities and different types of products. So it was, you know, in my best interest to go ahead and get my license. They supported that for my insurance license. And as that evolved, uh, those three advisors opened the door, allowed an opportunity for me to, you know, would you like to be an advisor? Would you like to step up and become a partner in the business? And they're looking at their retirement and wanting to, you know, how would they exit the business? And that was a great opportunity for me, you know, um, being able to have the opportunity to take control of your future, take control of what you can do for you. Um, and I jumped at the chance. I jumped at the opportunity. I stepped right up. And uh, next thing I knew, I was, you know, going through the training program, which I already have my licenses. I was already working with clients. I was already working with the advisors. And uh, one by one, they eventually retired and everything, you know, I took over those, those businesses. And from there, just was able to transition and catapult the business from what, if you want to say old school, to maybe a little bit more new school. Um, and from, you know, then the next thing was adding the branch manager role onto that. And then going from, you know, just myself to now I have a team of three people. Um, and we're just continuing to grow. So that's been my path was, I came up through the support through the industry, uh, before I started working for RBC, I actually was a receptionist. And then I became a, um, a new account rep for a discount brokerage. And then that's when I moved into the full service brokerage division as a client associate, got my licenses. And so at any level, you can start somewhere and you can just move forward. And it just, if you can think it, dream it, you can be it. Great. Thank you. Um, and Brooke, how about for you? Okay. Well, I've had the other two opportunities to listen to Jerry and Christine to see what they said. So now I can kind of um, tailor my remarks, but gosh, I, I mean, I think we could all talk for hours about how we got to where we are. And um, so I'm going to just, well, I live in New Jersey, so I talk fast. So I'm going to just cram all my, kind of my whole life into this two minutes. Um, I, uh, I'm from Baltimore, Maryland originally. I'm the oldest daughter of four kids. I have three younger, but now taller and bigger brothers. Um, I went to Clemson University in South Carolina. I thought I wanted to be a journalist. I thought for sure I was going to be the next Katie Kirk. And then when they told me I'd have to start out in some like little teeny, 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 tiny town in the middle of nowhere, I was like, well, no, I want to start in New York. And so I quickly decided that, that I needed to go a different path. I called my dad and I said, dad, the good news is that I get to uh, stay an extra semester and I get an extra football season to watch at Clemson. The bad news is, is I'm staying an extra semester in school. Um, but I changed my major in my junior year to business. And I did that because I really wanted to get just a really broad understanding of the business world. I wasn't quite sure at that time how I was going to apply it, but I knew I just wanted to learn a little bit about accounting, econ, finance, statistics, you name it. Um, and so I'm really glad I made that decision. Um, uh, after Clemson, um, uh, sadly, I graduated right after 9-11. Um, and um, I'm sure like all of us, we can remember exactly where we were on that day. And I was getting ready to leave for class that day um, in my senior year. And I just remember seeing all of that and the aftermath of just how that city really banded together. And I said to myself, I want to be there. Like, I, I want to be in New York City. I want to start a career there. I want to work in finance. In my opinion, um, you know, if you wanted to work in finance and you wanted to be at the top of your game, you know, it was New York. That's where you went. And so uh, I did not have a job, um, but I sold my car for a couple thousand dollars, which would get me a couple months rent, maybe two months rent in New York. And I said, look, if I can't get a job in two or three months by pounding the pavement and handing out business cards and shaking hands at the time, because that was pre-COVID, <laughs> but if I can't get a job in a couple year, a couple months, then it, then New York wasn't meant to be. Um, and fortunately, um, you know, I was able to make some connections and interview at a lot of um, firms in New York, and I landed at my first job, which was uh, Lake Mason. 
Um, and I spent a couple of years at Lake Mason just learning the business, right? So eager, so hungry, so determined to be successful. I was willing to just, you know, dip my feet into anything that would give me good, um, good learning. I got my Series 7. Um, I developed some great relationships. It was there that I met um, um, uh, a manager at Lake Mason who then was recruited to RBC. And when he was recruited to join RBC, he brought myself and a couple other um, people from Lake Mason with him. And it was interesting because um, when he brought me to RBC, they didn't really have a position for me because I was right out of college. I certainly wasn't even thinking about being a financial advisor at that point. Um, and he really had to convince RBC, you know, you really want to find a position for this, this young woman because she's going to do good things. She's going to be successful. You have to take this, this chance on her. And, um, and thankfully RBC did, they created a role for me um, called the business development consultant. I think a lot of people were kind of scratching their heads saying like, what exactly is this? It's the only one in the firm that, that has that title. Um, and really it was kind of like a marketing business development role for me to work alongside with all the financial advisors in the New York City office, which was the flagship, um, lar the largest office. Um, and um, uh, it allowed me to learn the business. It allowed me to get a feel for what they do every day and how they work with clients and what clients look for in an advisor. And it really, it didn't take me long to realize that it wasn't rocket science. And that um, the most successful financial advisors were people that were just like me. And that was people that were very effective communicators, people that conveyed exceptional trustworthiness to their clients, um, and uh, people that could relate um, because clients just really want to feel comfortable. They want to feel like you understand. Um, and that's what, the, you know, myself and Christine and Jerry and, you know, all the others at our firm, and um, that's what we do really well. And so, um, you know, I decided in 2009 that I was going to transition to become a financial advisor. I was also pregnant with my first child at the time. So for me, it's kind of like the more balls in the air, the better. And I feel like I work better under that, that pressure, if you will. And so I officially became a financial advisor in 2010. Um, my son was born in March of 2010. My first day in production was, was in May of 2010. So um, I tend to take risks. I tend to not think about doing things. Instead, I just do them. And then I figure out how to be successful at it. Um, and it was honestly the best decision that I've made in my professional career was to become a financial advisor. I absolutely love, love, love what I do because um, it's working with people every day and getting to know what's important to them. It's not because... I like numbers or math or studying financial charts, actually, to be perfectly honest, like I don't like that stuff at all. What I like is talking to Mr. And Mrs. Jones about what's important to them and what their goals are and how their grandkids are. And, and that's, that's, that's what this career is, is really that relationship. So, um, yeah, that's kind of how I got here. You know, I took some risks and fortunately they panned out. And similar to Jerry and Christine, I am also a branch director, which, you know, we are all natural born leaders and um, it's it's worked out really nicely. So that's a little bit about how I got to this chair. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Brooke. Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit. We've talked about this a little bit, but I'd love to know kind of what a typical day is for any of you. I know a typical day in March, 2021 is probably vastly different than say a typical day in February of 2020. So um, Jerry, could you tell us a little bit about, you know, what your typical day is like and kind of what has changed for you in the last, last year? So um, the biggest change in the last year is I'm physically not in the office. Uh, Brooke and Christine obviously are, uh, just, it's a smaller office. So that's the biggest change is working from home and immediately transitioning to living in front of a computer and in front of the video with your clients, walking the clients, helping them get comfortable with, they can do this. We can help them, you know, so we can still get that connectivity that 
taking the time with the client, just an extra time, being patient, slowing it down to walk them through the technology so they understand and feel comfortable having a camera on them and how it works and going to these virtual meetings, um, being able to share my screen and you know what you plan for about 45 minute virtual conference with your client ends up being an hour and 15 and sometimes an hour and a half because the clients, you can see them relax. You can see them engage. And then they just start, they're like, oh, well, can we do this again? So that is definitely the biggest change from, you know, a year ago to where we are today is just the more involved that clients are wanting to have the video call. Uh, it's not so much, you know, it's so much easier now working with clients because not all of our clients are right in the very city. Like Christine, you know, most of her clients are two, over two hours away. Um, we've got clients all over the United States. So now it's created this genuine connectivity of being able to virtually see each other and still conduct business all day long. Um, a day for me is, you know, starting early, I have a team meeting, which I make virtual. Um, two days a week, I have virtual meeting with my entire branch office to keep everybody connected. And I'm like, come on, people, turn on your cameras. I want to see your faces. Uh, just to keep people connected that way. And then team meetings, obviously, with my team, you know, we thought when we were physically working in the branch together that we could see each other. We've learned over this year, we were not communicating. We thought we were communicating, but today we communicate better with each other than we did well over a year ago. Um, obviously with our systems, we've got like some instant messaging besides the emails um, of how we're connected as a team. Um, you know, I will have, my day is very scheduled. Uh, from this meeting to this meeting to this meeting, you know, client reviews. Um, and then there's also time that you have to have scheduled because as proactive as we try to run our businesses with our clientele, um, you know, it's very important. A client wants to get a phone call on their birthday. They want to get a birthday card. They want to know that you care about them. And as to like what Brooke said, it's, this is a relationship business and, I think maybe as women, that's how we excel is because we believe in, re in relationships. It's our default. We have relationships. Um, we care about what goes on in, in our clients' lives. And they just, they, you have to be an active listener and hear what they have to say. And the rest, it just follows. But the days are nine, 10 hours long, um, sometimes very exhausting but more times than not, extremely rewarding. Um, just knowing that you made a difference in somebody's life that day, you helped them plan for their retirement, you know, those conversations and running our wealth plan software and sharing your screen with the client and having them say, oh my gosh, I can, I can actually retire when we planned and it's going to be okay. And just hearing that relief in their voice and seeing their faces, um, it's, it's extremely re rewarding. And like to what Brooke said, you know, I'm not a big math person. I don't want to sit and play with numbers all day long, every day. It's, it's just understanding what are people's goals and how can you match portfolios, build portfolios and investments, risk tolerances. And I think that's where maybe the active listening piece comes in. So um, a day in my life is, the phone is connected, the camera's on, and you're either talking or listening about nine hours all day long. So that's my day. <laughs> that's great. I love that. I love that it's about relationships because I do think a lot of people would think it's, you know, math and spreadsheets and numbers. So that's, that's I think, great to hear. Christine, you look like you might be in an office too, or you have a very yeah. very good home office setup. So can you talk now, a little bit I, about what your day is like? Yeah, I'm in the office. Um, you know, I like to say I'm a problem solver. Um, I'm a problem solver in the office as the branch director. I'm, the prom I'm a problem solver to my clients. So my average day is also a team meeting at the beginning uh, with my team that services clients. 
And then I also have a team meeting with uh, the um, service manager in the office for office staff. And so I have two team meetings in the morning. Um, and then, you know, I, I would say I try to structure my day so much so that I have at least three client appointments. They are, to, to Jerry's point, they are electronic virtually now. Um, I, I equate this to meeting in their living room. So uh, often I go to my clients instead of my clients coming to my office. It's, you know, I, I'm from a small town. So Watertown, New York is small. We know these people. And I find that I get more, um, we get really more down to what is really making them stay awake at night as far as problems financially if we're sitting in their kitchen and they can have a cup of coffee and they can, you know, quickly, geez, I don't have that right out on the table. I can go find it. And so, you know, I do miss that, but the virtual does get them back into their kitchen, right? And, um, and they're, they have everything at their fingertips. So I like to do at least three client meetings a day. Um, and again, that's what the team meeting is for, is just to review what do we have today, what do we have coming up tomorrow. And then, you know, we do, in between those meetings, do a lot of uh, review of portfolios. We review their investments for the next, for the next meeting. Um, and then as far as branch management is concerned, uh, I have office hours, so I, I, my door is always open as a manager, but there are times when I have to close it. And so people know that it'll always be open from this time to this time uh, and they can ask me questions. And so a lot of my day now is people popping in, having a need that, uh, that I need to problem solve. And so that leads me to, I'm problem solving all day long. I get home and then, you know, my kids or my husband have a problem and I want to solve it. And they say, I don't want you to solve my problem. I just want you to listen. <laughs> so <laughs> that tends to be uh, what happens at home once I've done this all day. So. Great. That's, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah, you problem solve during the day and you uh, listen to everybody at night. That's, that's a busy day. <laughs> so Brooke, how about you? What, what's kind of your typical day? And I see, you know, you're in an office as well. So how are things, you know, do you have things been different for you over the past year? Yeah, so I um. I think like most financial advisors, we're pretty competitive by nature. Um, that's just how we're wired. Um, I start my day off at 5.30 in the morning um, and I do a pretty intense workout um, every morning at 6 a.m. And I cannot start my day without it. Um, and uh, it's um, it, it just gives me the adrenaline. Like I leave there at 7 a.m. and I feel like I can climb Mount Everest because I've already got this complete you know, before most people are waking up. So for me, um, I'm not necessarily in the office. I'm never the first one in the office. Um, and that's partly because um, I am very passionate about getting in my fitness routine because that makes me better throughout the whole day. Um, and I also like to see my kids in the morning because I typically work pretty late at night. And um, oftentimes I don't get to see them at night. So I like to usually, um, you know, French, French braid my daughter's hair in the morning or <laughs> attempt to brush my son's hair because God knows if he goes to school with his hair everywhere, it's like, ah, but, um, but so I, I treasure that time. And so that's one really awesome thing about this career is that you have that flexibility, right? So it's not like a timestamp where I have to be at my desk at 8am and pencils down at five, right? It's kind of like it is what it is and it is what you make of it. I am, as you can see, I am back in the office. Um, I did work from home uh, from March of 2020 through October of 2020. So, um, you know, for that time period. And then I came back in the office because we happened to bring um, a new uh, team into my into my branch here. So that, that um, caused me to come back in the office. And I have to tell you a little secret. And um, thankfully my husband's not on this event right now, but, um, I could not be happier to be in the office. <laughs> we'll, we'll never tell him. We'll never tell him. I, I absolutely love my husband and kids and two dogs and all the craziness at home. Like it was so fun to be home with them. Um, but, uh, I'm so happy to be back in, in my space and my things and my, you know, um, printers and two monitors and, it's just, I, I leave in the morning and I'm like, okay, you guys have a fun day. Bye. <laughs> and they're like, oh, um, but you know what? It's, this is where I need to be. And I'm super fortunate to have a very supportive husband that, that runs the house and it, look, it works. It works for us. 
um, no family, no two families are the same and you have to do what works for your family. And this is what, what works for us. So I wish I was more structured like Jerry and Christine, because um, I was, as they were talking about, they have a set team meeting every day and they have office hours as a branch director. Ugh, for me, it's a little bit more like rapid fire. Um, and uh, it's a lot like black blocking and tackling throughout the day. Um, and, and then I kind of, toward the end of the day, take time to breathe and decompress everything and follow up on things I wasn't able to. Um, but I'm very much a person where I don't like to leave anything looming over my head. I like to leave at night thinking that everything has been responded to or taken care of or um, progressing to the to the next next level. Um, so yeah, I would say that's kind of a normal day. It's action packed. It's never uh, quiet. It's never slow. But I absolutely would not have it any any other way. Great, that's great. Now, um, Jerry, what? And you talked. You, I think, it talked a little bit about you know relationships, and you've all talked about relationships, but. What what skills do you think that you've really had that um, has kind of helped you the most in your career? Being a mom, honestly. Okay. Um, you know, I think uh, being a single mom, from my standpoint, you know, learning how to balance time, learning that when you know, and I think trying to run a household and trying to raise two boys um, at the same time, it, it was like they wanted attention. They wanted my attention. They needed my attention. And I think having the compassion that we have, um, being able to look my children in the eyes and, and let them know that when they're talking to me, I am hearing what they have to say to me. You know, and understanding, just watching them, understanding their cues, understanding, you know, maybe they're not saying something, but you, you know, you sense it, you feel it just by watching them. Um, I think that's probably the, the best skill set that helped me come to the table besides, you know, it created a fire in my belly, you know, um, I wanted to set my path. I didn't want someone else to set my path. And so like, you know, to what Brooke said that everybody's family lives are different. Everybody's personal lives, whatever that might be, we all have different paths to walk. And it, I think it doesn't matter what path you're on, you pull skills in with you. And I think the biggest thing, you know, a lot of people always say, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't, you can't make it drink. You have to have that passion and that fire in your belly to want to do something, you know, and once you get that, hold on to that and, and just grow, you know, I wanted to be a leader. I wanted to be a strong, a strong role model for my boys, you know, and I couldn't be prouder today to see what they're doing and what they're accomplishing and those are their accomplishments, but I look at it that, okay, I gave them dedication. I showed them how to be dedicated. I showed them how to be honest and trustworthy and committed. And if you say you're going to be somewhere, then you be there, you know, um, responsibility. And I think with all of those, those helped me. And now just being able to listen to clients and be there for clients, let them know that I care and what they're going through is important to us, that they're not a number. I think that's something with my team. We, we really emphasize that with our clients to let them know that they are an individual and we know so much about them. And, and it goes back to relationship. It's just listening to them and letting them know that you're there for them. Um, I think being a single mom for me and desire and passion and commitment, it just, it, it grew and it was born from there. That's great. That's great. Now, and Brooke, you were just speaking earlier about um, 
what it seems to me you're you are someone that thrives on fast paced, high energy life. Um, is that one of the skills you think that's helped you throughout your career? Or do you have other skills that you would maybe credit that to? Yeah, I think, um, um, uh... Yes. So I would echo what Jerry said about listening. I think we keep hearing that come up over and over as being a good listener. And somebody gave me really great career advice early on. And they said, Brooke, you have two ears and one mouth for a reason. You need to listen more than you talk. And for me, I was, you know, I, I like to talk a lot. So that was kind of a little Okay. Um, but, but yeah, we have to listen and sometimes you have to bite your tongue a little bit and just let people, because when there is silence, as we know, people will feel awkward and then they will want to share more. Um, and so, you know, is as fast paced as I am a lot of the time, um, when I'm doing a client review, um, or a video call with a client, I mean, I am like very, um, calm and very much I take as much time as they need and truly I feel that that is what sets me and Jerry and Christine and many others um, at RBC that's what sets us apart from the competition you know I always relate it to when I go to the doctor and I've waited like six months to get a doctor's appointment and I've waited in the waiting room for who knows how long I finally get in there to meet with the doctor and it's like, boom, 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 boom. Okay. You're good. See you in a year. And I'm like, wait, what? I didn't even get to ask you any questions. I, I had this whole list of things and, and then you're out the door because they are getting to the next patient. And I, and I kind of relate that to my business in the sense that I don't want my clients to have that experience. I want them to literally feel like I will talk to them for two hours if they want um, about what's important to them. And, and, and I really pride myself on that. So yes, it's a, a bit like rapid fire behind the scenes, but when it's actually game time, I feel like I put my game face on and, um, and I just kind of relax and, um, talk, you know, very openly with my clients. And, um, so, so yes, yeah, so the relationship is key. I will say another piece of advice that I got from somebody, um, very early on in my financial advisory career. In fact, it was on my very first day as an advisor. So May, 2010, I'll never forget this. I was, um, in the New York city office and I went to the kitchen to grab some water or tea or something of that sort. Uh, no coffee. Surprisingly, I don't drink coffee. You would think I drink a lot of coffee. I don't drink coffee. Um, but I went into the kitchen and, um, and there was one of the top, one of the top producers was getting some coffee. And I said to him, I said, oh gosh, so-and-so I said, today's my first day as an advisor. I said, I'm so nervous. I don't even know what to think or what to do or, you know, and he said, he looked at me and he said, Brooke, just show up. And I said, well, Bob, you know, come on give me more. I need more. I need more of the secret sauce than just show up. And he said, trust me. He said, you're a hard worker. And if you just simply show up and continue to work hard, good things will happen to you. Yeah. And I, I think about that all the time, you know, because if you're a hard worker, failure is not an option. Like it is just not. And so just show up. Your work yeah. ethic will take you the rest of the way. So yeah. that's, I love that advice. It was so, so simple, but really it stayed with me, you know, my whole career. So yeah, I love that. Christine, how about for you? What kind of skills do you think have really helped you throughout your, your career? Yeah, this is a business of trust. And I know uh, Jerry has said that, Brooke has said that. Uh, and so, you know, how do you build trust? The people are giving you the means to fulfill their goals when they give you the money that they've invested. And so the, their goal is not money. Their goal is, is retirement or travel or new homes. And so they've given you this means and no financial advisor wants their client to lose money, but the market goes up and down. And so there are time periods that, you know, trust is really what it's based on. And um, how you build that trust is the ability to follow through. So my, my clients know 
that if I promised them something or I did something, I, I will do it. Uh, and that's how we build the trust. And so that when, when things do go crazy, like last March, uh, and the market's down 25%, they know if I say, listen, you have to hold on, I'm going to hold your hand, we're going to get through this, but, but you have to hold on, they know I'm, I'm there for them and doing that for them. That's great. So that's the first thing. Go ahead. Oh, I was, I, please keep going. Yeah, so that's the, you know, the ability to follow through because like Brooke said, I did call them back before I went home. I did, uh, you know, move, uh, do some money transfers before, you know, so I made sure they were a priority and, and if they called me, they got an answer before I left for the office one way or the other. So it's those little things. Love um, and then the second, oh, go ahead. <laughs> the second piece to that I would say is that, you know, this industry is, uh, you never know everything. I, I knew nothing when I started. Um, and so you are always a student of this business. And uh, one very wise financial advisor told me on my very first day at RBC, uh, he said to me something that I think of every day. And it's the, the day you know everything about this business is the day you need to retire. You mm -hmm. need to be a student. And, and so I would say that you don't need to know everything, uh, but you learn, you learn more and more. Every day I learn something. Love that. Now, um, uh, Brooke, what would be your kind of number one piece of advice for people who are either maybe have had a career and are looking to make a change into financial advising or you know, someone that's pretty new out of school and maybe hasn't, hasn't done much um, in terms of full-time work? What would you say your number one piece of advice would be for them? Besides if showing up, which is great advice. Yeah, yeah just show up. Um, no, if, if, are you asking if they're looking to be in financial advisory or, yeah, yeah. Okay. exactly. Well, like if came to you. Okay. So twofold, if they're just out of school, college, or early on, I say in your twenties, um, then do anything in the financial services field to just get experience, right? Because I feel really strongly, and I'm not sure what Jerry and Christine think about this, but, um, I feel really strongly that a, a financial advisor career is something that you do a little bit later um, after you have some experience. There is a certain degree, as we've all said, trust over and over again, right? No matter how smart you are, no matter what college you attended, um, if you don't have some years under your belt, if you don't, as I say, have a little bit of gray hair and, you know, um, you know, maybe, um, you know, you're, I just think that it's best if you're maybe in, in your thirties before you become an advisor, because I was really struggling when I was in my twenties with confidence um, in that, how are, how are clients going to trust me, someone in my twenties at the time with all of their assets, if I'm, you know, um, in my twenties, I just, I didn't have that confidence and that professional arrogance that, that I think is so important to have if, uh, when you're an advisor. Um, so do anything, I would say. Um, it doesn't even have to be financial services. If you have a career and you could do any kind of sales, right? Because if you can sell a paperclip, then, you know, you could sell anything. Um, so I would say just get experience. Um, if you are already experienced and, and you are, um, you know, looking to become a financial advisor, I would say, just, just do it. Like I said earlier, don't think about it. Don't overanalyze it as, as women, we tend to, and I know Jerry and Christine, we've heard this at so many conferences, but you know, when women apply for a job, they tend to look at the qualifications and, um, if they don't have 10 out of 10 qualifications that are on the job posting, they say, mm, you know, I guess I'm not qualified for this job. There's one thing on that list that, you know, I just don't really, haven't really done versus a man will look at that list and say, hmm, I've done two of these things. Two out of 10 is not bad. I'm going to apply for it. Right. So like, we have to have that mentality. Like you have to sell yourself. You have to sell yourself and your potential. So, you know, just do it. Um, you know, if you're confident in yourself, which everyone should be, then, um, then it should just be something that, that comes natural and, and just align with people that can mentor you. I mean, we all got to where we are here today, not by ourselves, um, but because we were smart enough to um, um, spot people that wanted to help us along the way. And um, mentorship is, is incredibly important, um, in my opinion. Great. 
great. Now, Jerry, what do you think in terms of advice for someone either early career? And then we also do have a question about someone in their forties looking into to going into the profession. Would you have any, any advice for them? Um, absolutely. So first thing uh, to address the question, somebody in their forties looking to get into the career and get into there. My, my first recommendation is look, look up all of the full service firms in your area. Just look them up, find, find out what companies are in your area. Is it an RBC wealth management? If it is, Hey, we'll tell you how to apply, how to get in this, in the door. Um, if it, you know, any one of these firms. So first look at who they are, find out who the branch manager is. You know, all of this, has, use your LinkedIn, use all of your social media to find out who's out there. Then from there, walk in the door, you know, find out a way, how can you connect, get the email address, you know, get the phone number of that branch manager that's in that local area, walk in the door, send them an email, let them know who you are, and that you are just looking to sit down and have a conversation. And maybe you're interested in an internship. You know, they might be offering internships within that office. Like, you know, to what Brooke said, you have to get experience. And how do you get that? It doesn't just come, you know, like I said, you know, it's like if you, you're going to see I'm not qualified, so you walk away. Well, you have confidence in yourself and you don't give up. You keep going in there and say, you know, what is available, even if it's a receptionist job. And I know that that's not where we all want to start, but hey, I already did that. So, you know, it can happen. Um, you just, you keep pushing and you don't give up and, and you look for an opportunity to get on a team, somehow get involved, you know, whether it's working in the cage and understanding our business is so full of acronyms that sometimes I have to write them down so I know what we're talking about. Um, but it, it, it's not, and even coming right out of college, you know, for someone coming right out of college, you know, I recently, well, about three years ago, I had an intern that just graduated from college and he just kept blowing up my email and blowing up my email, a male, you know, great guy. He wanted a job. Um, and finally we interviewed him, uh, worked well. I hired him as an intern. I said, this is all you're going to get. This is the best I can do for you. Well, he learned, he was a quick learner. He picked up on it and now he's a part of my team full time. Uh, it worked out. He wants to be a financial advisor, um, this person and is just determined and passionate. But even talking to him today, he will tell you what he learned in finance and what he learned, you know, going through college what we actually do all day long, every day, he said it, they couldn't be further apart in a daily basis. So biggest recommendation is know what opportunities and businesses are in your area. Find out who the managers are. Find out who the financial advisors are. Get a connection with them with on LinkedIn or however you need to. Start emailing them making phone calls, giving them, you know, you don't want to just drop off your resume. You want to sit down or just ask them, hey, you know, do you have 15 minutes that I could discuss with you about your career and how you got in the business? I'm interested. I want to learn. I want to see, you know, maybe you have advice for me. And that person might have connections. They might know someone who might be hiring or who might be looking for, you know, someone to add to their team and be willing to pay it forward because almost every advisor that's out there they started somewhere and more times than not somebody's going to be willing to reach their hand out and say okay you know what I'm going to give you an opportunity let's see where this goes from there um, I would love to say that we're all born financial advisors we walk in the door and boom it's happening and it's growing but when you're dealing with one of the most sacred pieces of a client's life, their finances, you know, that is their stability for the rest of their life. They're not willingly going to hand it over. They have to earn the trust and the relationship. You have to build it. Um, that's my recommendation is just, you know, baby steps, 
find a way in, look for internships or, you know, associate financial advisor programs, entry level places that can just get your foot in the door, then you prove yourself and you will grow. You will get somewhere. Yeah, I love that. Uh, Christine, I want to hear your answers in just a moment, but I did want to say we have about 10 minutes left. So if you have a question, now is the time to drop it in the QA or drop it in the chat so we can get to as many as possible. So Christine, I'd love to hear your advice for, um, you know, if you agree with Brooke about um, maybe a career as a financial advisor is maybe a better idea when you're slightly older or are there advantages yeah, so I, of someone younger? Yeah, I was going to speak to the 40 year old uh, question. Um, you know, when I started in this business, I was in my twenties and they made me make a list of 150 people. 150 people that would be a center of influence for me, someone who would either refer someone to me or someone who I knew had means and probably needed or would have a financial advisor that maybe they would switch to me. And I feel that if you if you are in your 40s, you have a much better center of influence list. And so if you're thinking about making a switch and, and becoming a financial advisor and you already have a career, uh, you have a wonderful center of influence. You have who you currently work with. You have your friends, your family, your 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 kids' parents. And so you kind of make that list. You make the list of who it would be that you would feel comfortable calling and saying, hey, I became a financial advisor today, and I'd love to sit down with you and tell you a little bit about my business and uh, how I can help you reach your financial goals. And, you know, if you build that list, uh, you've got something to come in to a financial firm with. And so I would say for, for someone who has a career, we just had someone in our office start, and uh, it was an estate planning attorney. Uh, an estate planning attorney has so many wonderful, and they would rather be a financial advisor. And so 40 years old, came over to the RBC Buffalo office, uh, and his center of influence is amazing. And so, he, you know, he made a list and he has started to call those people and has made some great strides. So can it be done? Absolutely. And the, the, that's why in your 20s, you're kind of calling your parents friends, not your friends. And so you tend, you know, if you have your friends are like you, they just graduated from college. They have student loan debt. You know, so there's a lot. But I will say this. If you're young and coming out of college and you want into this industry, Jerry said, you know, it's okay to start at the bottom here. They get paid very well at the bottom in, in, in the financial services industry, and they don't stay there long if they're a hard worker. So it is very much recognized. It's okay to start at the bottom and work your way up, learn the business, get your licenses, um, and show and, and be verbal about the fact that, this is not this is not where you want to end. You want to end in their seat. And as long as you show that drive and you've communicated the path you'd like to take, you will get there fairly quickly. Yeah. Could I'm be not. even within like five years if you're you know, if you if you show that. Yeah, that's great. So we have about five minutes left. So just quickly, um, I know we have a lot of people who are interested in starting a career, um, just in, you know, kind of three different skills that you look for, you know, just kind of maybe words in terms of somebody that if you were, if they were a candidate for you, what would be the top three skills you would look for? Um, let's see, Jerry. Um, Self-starter would be first. Um, I, for me, that's probably the most thing, uh, the biggest and most important. Um, I'd let Brooke and Christine maybe add to that. Yeah, love that. Um, I would say multitasker, you know, so somebody that can hold many balls at the same time. And it uh, doesn't mean that balls don't drop. It's how you pick it up on the bounce uh, that's important. Love that. Love that. Brooke, how about for you? Yeah, I like that, Christine. It's about, I like how you said that, it's about how you pick it up on the bounce. Um, um, someone who's driven, I think, is and, and work ethic, um, I think, are two really important for me and someone who's passionate about what they do and someone who likes to have fun. Right. We spend a lot of time mm -hmm. doing doing our, our in our career. And so we have to be happy and enjoy it. Yeah. And, and, and all of you, we have another question about, um, you know, given the last year, if RBC is 
changing into maybe a remote first or work from home with flexibility. I know you all have mentioned being supported as a mother, when, particularly when your children were small. Um, have there been any kind of company-wide changes around that? Um, any, any of you have, any of you would like to answer? I'm sure yeah. they're probably still, oh, go, go ahead, Jerry. Go, no, go ahead, Brooke, go ahead. Um, you know, I think it's really caused every business to evaluate their go forward plan. Um, I think RBC is doing that very same thing. I think there's some aspects that of course, you know, you know, we need to be in the office, um, but will there be more flexibility in general? Absolutely. But will we be a completely work from home business? I don't think so. And that's not what I would want anyway. Yeah. Um, so again, there's a lot of people interested in the career. Um, where where can they, they go to learn a little bit more about the company, maybe to learn? Um, I, I definitely recommend they check out the RBC Fairy Godboss profile. They can also find jobs there. Is there anywhere else or are there, you know, kind of maybe types of positions that you think would be, you know, particularly uh, hot right now? Um, Christine? Yeah, so uh, the RBC website, uh, you have to go to the U.S. website, RBC U.S. Wealth Management website does have the careers posted there as well to answer that question. Um, and then, you know, I think it depends on uh, where you want to go as far as what positions. Uh, there are always client associate positions open. If you do not have licenses, you do need a license to be a client associate, but you also, uh, they will hire a client associate without a license. Uh, as long as you're willing to get one. And RBC will sponsor you on that license uh, path as well. Great, great. I can, I can add something on that as well. Another entry-level career path, uh, just to get your foot in the door, I know with RBC. Another one would be what we call our wealth planning associates. And that is using our wealth, learning our wealth planning software that we have and that we use. And then you would actually be working within different complexes. You know, you're kind of a support role for multiple people, multiple advisors across a specific complex in your area to become kind of a specialist, to be able to assist in client meetings and give presentations. So you learn a lot that way too, in working with clients in so many different aspects. Along that, you would be able to get your license and you'd be able to kind of move forward. So it's a way that you get some experience and you know, you're not just tied to one individual branch or one individual advisor. There's, there's just a multitude of areas that you can get involved. I love that. Well, um, we're just about at time. I wanted to say thank you to all three of you, Christina, Christine, excuse me, Brooke and Jerry for your time. Um, again, please check out the Fairy God Boss page. It sounds like there's a lot of interesting opportunities for entry level and for people who are maybe thinking about a career change. Um, so thank you all again very much and have a great uh, rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much.